Great to uh, see everybody again. I, uh, I really enjoyed the uh, like Scala or Northwest Scala Symposium and, and Philly ETE is an amazingly good conference too. I got to go to that some years ago as well. Um, yeah, you know, in your honor, I picked the uh, Four Seasons background here, the famous Four Seasons in, in your illustrious town. So uh, I added a little Bernie action, I guess it's over here. Um, let me paste a link into the chat myself. This I'm actually gonna go through this page that's on my website uh, that just kind of summarizes Scala 3 highlights. And so if you get bored, you can just you know, look at it later. I won't have time to go through it all because there's obviously a lot that's changed in Scala 3. Um, I work for Domino Data Labs. I'll just, you know, shameless plug for them briefly. It's basically a platform for data science, the integrating open source tools like Spark uh, and, and things like that. But, um, you know, if you've if you got an enterprise data science environment, you might check us out. And we also we use a lot of Scala there. So if you're looking for a new post, uh, yeah, check out our, uh, our actually a completely revamped careers page, apparently. So anyway, dominodatalab.com is where you can find that. Uh, let's see, what else did I want to mention? Um, I guess this is it. We can get started here. So what I'm going to do, as I say, is I'll walk through some changes um, that, that are coming in Scala 3, kind of maybe editorialized a little bit as we go. I, you know, I've been working with it a lot because I'm uh, actually doing the, the next edition of Programming Scala, the O'Reilly book, which is almost done. It'll probably be out in a month or so. And uh, it's really focused on Scala 3 with some coverage of Scala 2 stuff because there's this transition process that's going to happen. So I'll talk about that a little bit as well. A few links here that you can find more information. I've been blogging about it as well. Uh, you can actually download all the code examples for the book, but they're not well documented because you're supposed to read documentation in the book in this case. Okay, and uh, you can even start with Scala 3 using SBT 1.5. It's uh, pretty easy to use. Um, there's a couple links here for getting started, including an example project that uh, the Dottie folks put together. Dottie being the kind of research version of Scala 3 that is uh, you know, short for the dependent object typing system, basically. Um, let me start with one of the most interesting and, and controversial uh, changes, which is the ability to actually use braceless syntax or significant indentation, a couple of different ways to describe it. It looks a lot more like Python. Uh, you know, this is, you, you could imagine this was pretty controversial when Adursky introduced it. And I was very much against it at the beginning, but I decided, all right, if this is a Scala 3 book I'm working on, I should really do everything Scala 3-ish. And, and started using it and actually decided I really liked it in the end because it's, it is a lot more concise. Scala is generally very concise, but it's even more concise. Um, and it probably would nominally appeal to people that are used to indentation oriented languages like Python and so forth. Although that's not a terribly you know, good reason really. But in general, I think it actually works rather well and I've come to really like it. But it's not a replacement. You can still use the old syntax if you want. Dean, uh, and you, all the examples, or most of them, will actually use uh, the Scala 3 syntax. Dean, did you mean to be sharing your screen? Oh, sorry, completely forgot to do that. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, you'll have to give me uh, permission to share. Yeah, hold on. Let me just, um, let me just make you a co-host. Okay. I completely forgot okay. it was yep. sharing. Should be good to go. All right, so I'll just share the whole screen. There we go. Let's get this out of the way a little bit. Okay, so um, anyway, this is the, the page that I pasted the link for in the chat, which is just, I wanted to put together a quick summary of Scala 3 highlights. And I'm you know, working on the third edition of the book, same uh, tape here as the animal of choice. Um, it is kind of almost a complete rewrite. I, I spent way too much time on this edition, but I really wanted to Kind of embrace the full spirit of Scala 3 and uh, you know, really think about how I would want to use Scala if I was starting from scratch with Scala 3, while at the same time discussing migration uh, policies that you might follow and how the Scala community, uh, the design team in particular, is trying to make it easy to migrate uh, without too much pain. Okay, so there are some links here for more information, uh, including a blog uh, series that I've been writing about Scala 3 that's on Medium. So as I mentioned, we'll talk about new syntax, uh, and I'll mostly use that. I'll show a few examples with the old syntax, but uh, we'll mostly you know, use the new syntax. But one of the most recent changes, uh, this was like literally uh, release candidate one, is they're actually going towards star as the wildcard for imports. 
it's just instead of uh, underscore. And the rationale here is that um, star is used by so many languages that we might as well just uh, be consistent. Not, not only Java, but uh, I think Python and so forth. Um, and if you actually do have a method named star that you want to import, you can use backticks. But the, the, you know, the original rationale for not using star was just, it actually didn't make that much sense in the long run because people didn't need to import a star that often. Um, I'll talk about what this given keyword is about later. This is the new way of importing implicits, but uh, you know, otherwise it kind of looks the same as what we're used to. If you want to import several things, you can put them in uh, curly braces. Uh, if you're just going to do one alias, now you don't have to use braces and they've replaced the arrow with the as keyword, uh, which is a new keyword. So it'll just be Q as JQ or something like that. And similarly, if you do want to uh, you know, hide something, then here you do actually still use the underscore. So hash map as underscore and then everything else is what this last import statement is doing. Okay, so um, yeah, and if you really want to import something like matrix multiplication, then you just use uh, you know, escapes like so. So here's an example of what types look like with the braces as, that we're used to or no braces, where we use instead a colon to end the, uh, the, the type signature and then indentation that's now significant to show the, uh, the methods. And you, you can see you're saving one line. Uh, maybe that doesn't matter to you too much. If you're a Pythonista, this will look very familiar, but um, you know, otherwise it's not that different. Methods can now be multiple lines after an equal sign with no braces. So, you know, we used to do, uh, you know, one line methods without braces. Now we can use uh, multi-line methods. Otherwise it's the same. This will confuse Pythonistas, Pythonistas because it's still a equal sign after the signature, it's not a colon like you. In fact, I'd been doing a lot of Python at, at the previous job before Domino and I was doing this all the time, entering a, uh, a colon uh, after the type. And, until I, uh, you know, had the electroshock therapy and got out of that habit or whatever it was. Um, even things like partial functions generally work uh, with without braces like so. So I've, here I've defined a couple of partial functions that are, you know, take an option event and then return an int and, you know, do something very trivial, but just to show how that would work as well. Uh, match expressions also. Um, you know, no, no curly braces, no, nothing required in the way of like a colon or an equal sign. It just, uh, you know, based on uh, the keywords and the indentation, it just works. But one thing that doesn't work yet, although it probably will get fixed in a future release of Scala 3, is if I want to create my, like my own control structures, like a looping construct, um, you might recall that doing something like this was kind of nifty. I could define a function loop, which looks something like this, uh, this may be tail recursive, and then I could actually invoke it as if it was like a built-in, like a while loop or something. Um, this does not work with braceless indentation. Um, there is an experimental feature that you can enable with this language uh, command line option to try it, but it's not considered fully baked yet, so it's not part of the language just yet. But that'll be that's really like the only major thing where you'll still probably use uh, curly braces, um, you know, in a way that you would prefer not to. And also the imports that I mentioned earlier, you still have to use curly braces if you have a, a list of things. Okay, so you might find this completely offensive, not having curly braces, but I think if you try it, you'll actually kind of get used to it and get to like it a little bit. Now, there are also some tweaks to the control syntax, like for loops and if statements. So, uh, you know, this first line is how we're used to writing these things, like a one line uh, you know, for loop, as it were. Now you can drop the parentheses and use do as the keyword for uh, you know, what is basically a, a, a for loop that doesn't return some new collection. Whereas if it's a comprehension and you yield, then it looks something like this. So again, a little bit cleaner. Um, you may or may not like it. Uh, I'll go ahead and paste a couple of these into the REPL. So I'm actually running the um, release candidate three REPL up here. And I'm, I'm, uh, the way I'm doing it, oh, forgot to go into the console. I'm actually using the uh, code examples um, because I've have all the command line flags set up the way I want them. Okay, and uh, there we go. So now I've uh, I, I did a, a print loop and then uh, then I did a yield statement in several different ways. Now this last one, you know, I don't have to have this on the same line. I could uh, indent like so. It turns out indentation doesn't appear to be significant inside loops. If I leave it like this, it still works. 
So um, that's one case where maybe uh, you don't have to indent because it's smart enough to know it, it's either going to see a do or a yield to know that it's actually hit the end of the, uh, these expressions. Um, similarly, there's also a, an alternative syntax for if statements. Um, you can either write them the old fashioned way with parentheses or you can do if then with no parentheses. If I you know, copy and paste this, this actually will, will print yes. Oh, I guess I thought, I guess I did. Anyway, I thought I was already defined. I guess that was wrong. I'll go back up to here and there we go. I guess it prints no. So um, I also adopt these two uh, changes to these control structures, just again, to kind of embrace Scala 3, but um, you know, you can take it or leave it. There's some command line flags you can use to either force one or the other. There's even some flags that can trigger uh, the compiler to change your code to, you know, like get rid of braces or to go from the old if syntax to the new syntax, things like that. So it can actually help you migrate if you want, which is kind of nice. I, in fact, used that when I was first uh, taking my old code examples for the book and bringing them up to Scala 3. So it was quite helpful. Uh, one of the kind of interesting things they're doing with the use of new is uh, handling a lot more cases where things that are not case classes, you can instantiate without the new keyword. Uh, but it is handled a little bit differently. Whereas when you declare a case class, the only apply method that's automatically created is the one for the primary constructor. They'll actually synthesize um, uh, objects for all of the different uh, constructor arguments, uh, or constructors, I should say, that you've defined for a non-case class. So it's, I'm not sure why they chose that difference. I guess partly the reason is there's no way to tell which one you would consider primary. Uh, that's not quite correct either. Anyway, there was uh, someone told me a good reason why they, they don't work exactly like case classes. But nevertheless, the point being that um, uh, you don't have this oddity where if you suddenly declare a case class, you can drop the new. But if you didn't have a case class, you had to put in new. You can, in most cases, not actually use new anymore. Uh, so that's kind of a nice consistency uh, treatment. All right, I'll uh, I'd kind of blasted through that a little bit. Actually, maybe I should stop and see if there's any questions and before we get into the new implicit kind of stuff. Uh, the only thing that's come up so far has been um, some people on smaller screens are having a little bit of difficulty reading the bottom left. Okay. So um, I don't know if that if rearranging that would be better or just zooming in. Yeah, I'll just zoom in and... Uh, that should hopefully be better. Maybe but if you, if you still can't read it, please follow along with Dean in the um, uh, at the link at the top of the chat. That's another way. Yeah. All right, let's talk about uh, the, the biggest area of change probably, which is the so-called contextual abstractions. Um, what we used to really think of as the implicit mechanisms and how that's been changed. They really put a lot of thought into this you know, recognizing the power that we have with implicits, but also some of the disadvantages. And uh, I think it's, they've done a pretty good job coming up with new constructs that are more uh, intentful, that, that they're less about this underlying mechanism that you can adapt in all kinds of ways and more about um, idioms that very clearly express particular concepts. That's one way to put it. And then trying to close some loopholes that, were, that would cause problems for people. There's a lot of syntactical changes here that take a little getting used to, and some of which I'm not entirely sure why we have alternatives, but nevertheless, we do. Um, this is probably the one that will be the hardest to kind of get your head around, but I think it's, it's ultimately it'll be a really powerful change to the language. I'm going to pull this out just a little bit more so uh, the, the little, yeah, the, the bar up here doesn't wrap. Okay. Well, the first thing is um, all of us who've done Scala for a while are probably used to this arrow associ operator that lets us, you know, construct tuples with an arrow, you know, or you know, dash and greater than sign. And we're probably used to this idea that if you want to do something similar, you know, add a method to a type, you uh, create this implicit class and, you know, that takes the argument of the left hand object and then it adds the methods that do the right hand thing and so forth. Um, but you know, if you think about it from a beginner's mindset, that's like, that's like completely non-obvious. What is all this stuff with implicits? Why am I declaring a class here? You know, uh, couldn't it be simpler? And in fact, it can be simpler. So what they're doing in, in Scala uh, 3 now is actually real so-called extension methods, where instead of you know, this sort of convoluted stuff, if I can put it that way, 
it's it's a much more direct you know extension of some type signatures of some arguments and then a method and i'll explain all of this stuff in a little bit detail here as we go so it's uh, much more direct uh, crucially um the, the new mechanisms greatly reduce the number of implicit conversions and you know implicit wrapping that is that was required in Scala 2. There's really down to just a few cases where it'll be useful. And again, that's you know an area where a lot of things could go wrong for people. And um, so this is an idea of you know fixing it uh, as we as best we can. So let me walk through this a little bit. First, I'll talk about target name and I'll import that. So what target name is doing for us is it's a way of actually telling the compiler what name to use for this symbol, namely this method uh, in, in the JVM bytecode. And if I wanted to call this from Java, I would actually use arrow two. Now this name is not available from other Scala code, but it is visible for a Java code that wants to use it. So, you know, the rule of thumb now is if you are declaring operators like I'm doing here, then use the target name annotation to you know, nail down the name. Otherwise, it'll use the default um, you know, dollar sign tilde, dollar sign greater than, or GT, whatever that it's used in the past. Now, here's one thing that's slightly unfortunate. There's actually two ways of writing the type of B here. And you can see that either you can put all of the types required after the extension keyword, or you can do them in a way that's a little bit more familiar from the way we used to do things where uh, I only need the type A at the, at the outer scope and A being the thing that I'm going to extend. And then I can put the type B on the method, which is where the argument that, you know, the second, the, the right-hand side, the second thing it gets defined. This was the original syntax when they introduced um, extension methods. You couldn't actually do this other one until very recently, actually the release candidate one of Scala 3. I, why I dislike this is because it's two ways to do things. It'll be confusing for people, beginners especially. So I kind of hope they deprecate this uh, first version. I kind of wish they'd already done so. Um, but anyway, you have both options. I'll probably always use myself, you know, the second version because it looks a lot more like what I'm used to. So if I just go ahead and you know, define this extension method, then I can do the usual thing. I use tilde uh, greater than sign, so I didn't, you know, get confused with arrow so. And then I can do something like this. And once again, I have a tuple. So a much more direct way of adding methods to types with true extension methods. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll describe implicit conversions where you still might use them. And then I'll take more questions. I think I saw something pop up on the uh, chat a second ago. Um, uh, now for this one, I'm going to—I actually—I'm uh, showing a uh, basically a, a terminal session in the in the uh, uh, in the GIS. So I'll, I actually copied this to another place without all of that stuff. So let's suppose that I have some domain types like you know, representing dollars and percentages and salaries and so forth. And notice in particular the um, the salary class takes you know some sort of gross pay that a person is supposed to get. And then uh, you know taxes that are going to be deducted from that gross pay. But you know me being a someone who likes to make it easy for the end user, I want to make it easy for them to just put in doubles for both of these arguments. That's a bit risky because they could accidentally get them backwards. But let's just go with the idea. And then it'll automatic. I'd, I'd like a conversion that will automatically convert to dollars and percentages. And the way that's done now is. Uh, first, because you know implicit conversions are considered kind of risky, we want it. We have to explicitly enable it with a, a language import like so. Or you know, there's also a global compiler flag. And then we do these uh, new versions of implicit conversions called. Uh, well, actually, these are all all forms of implicit values. Implicit instances are going to are going to start with this keyword given. So in this case, I'm going to use a built-in new type called conversion. This is in the, uh, the Scala package. Um, and I'm going to do a conversion from double to dollars. And then uh, on the right-hand side is basically an anonymous function that uh, does the actual conversion, pretty trivial. And now I notice what happened here. This is actually anonymous. There's no like given foo colon type. Uh, I've actually declared this in an anonymous way and so the compiler synthesized a name that uses this um, convention. Um, and you can also use um, implicitly to get it if it's in scope. And there's a new method called summon that basically does the same thing. 
They, I think they added another method because implicit is now kind of a bad word effectively. So from now on, you'll be using summon basically. And notice also it's a lazy value. So this will be instantiated on demand. Okay. Now I could also give it a name. So let's do that for percentages. So now it's going to be named DT, uh, D2P. And then I can you know, construct a salary object just using um, you know, double values and and then when I do printf it, or println, it, uh, it uses the two string methods that I created up here on my types. Something else you'll notice is you can now embed underscores to like break up the, the chunks in these uh, uh, numeric literals so they're easy to read. There's actually no constraint on where they belong, so I can put them anywhere I want pretty much except around the, uh, the dots and things like that. So this is perfectly legal, Oops, not bad, and uh, get the same thing. But yeah, so that's a nice little way of making things a little more readable. Uh, okay, so both of these are lazy values. Let's see anything else to say on this. No, let me go on to uh, the comments that I have down here. Um, so basically, we're replacing implicit values or defs with these given instances, as they're called. And we'll see that they have different types depending on how we're defining things. And sometimes that will have interesting implications for the life cycle of these things. In this particular example, both of them were uh, lazy values. Um, and uh, Dean, we yeah. do have one question. Sure, let's go ahead and take it then. Okay, um, I, Dan uh, was asking, does the extension method feature allow for duck typing? And we may want him to unmute to clarify what he's really asking. Yeah, why don't you go ahead. The extension adds uh, methods to the to existing objects. Does that allow you to use those uh, without the type or what does the type become, become of those objects? Yeah, good question. Um, the type is not changed. Um, it's still like when I did, uh, let's see if, uh, let me find the example. Like here's, here's an example where I used a string with this extension method and the type is reported as just string. So it doesn't actually like modify the type at all. It sort of still works in the way that they used to work where I, you know, I did this temporary conversion to something, I called the new method and then I got back something else. And again, then, then that temporary thing kind of went out of scope, so to speak. So it, in this case, we don't actually modify the, the underlying type of the thing that I um, added to, which was just something of type A. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Oh, uh, yeah, one thing about these uh, conversions. So this syntax, like right here, this is just shorthand for given type thing. With is the keyword you use when you are actually uh, instantiating one of these um, uh, given instances and then defining the methods that are required. So it's like a trait. And here we're defining the apply method. And in fact, this looks a whole lot like a function. It's really just a fancy wrapper around a single argument function uh, that returns an argument. But so, so what I wrote up here that's highlighted in the terminal is basically this. I could have just done a def apply. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, it turns out, though, that the fact that equal sign is used here is going to be slightly confusing in a minute, unfortunately, as we'll see. But um, basically, that's the mapping that we've, we've done. Now, we, we can also use summon, as I said, to uh, find the conversion. Let me just copy it from here just to prove I'm not lying. And notice it even calls it a function. And I, it implicitly still works, too. So pretty much the same. OK. Now let's talk about type classes and how you would do those. And basically the gist of it is that a type class is a given, uh, or it's defined by traits, and then you use given instances to instantiate it for the particular context that you need. So what I'm gonna use is, um, you know, I, I can't do a Scala talk without something that seems to be vaguely category theory related, right? So let me define a semi-group and then a monoid. And a semi-group is just the generalization of addition or multiplication, something like that that should be associative. Um, and monoid adds the, uh, the um, identity element, the unit value, whatever. But notice how these are declared. I'm declaring these methods here as extension methods, but I'm not declaring unit as an extension method. And the reason is that I only need one unit uh, method per type T. 
So that's a good candidate to be on an object somewhere. Whereas I need to modify each instance of T to uh, you know, call combined because I'm going to be adding the left and the right hand side. Or if I'm using my Darth Vader TIE fighter space operator, I'll just call it Darth Plus for short. Um, then you know I, I have something on the left, which is this T up here, and then something on the right, which is other. Now, in this case, I've, I'm actually defining Darth Plus to be just com T dot combine other. So when I instantiate this, uh, these traits, I'll only need to define combine in this case. So let's see what that looks like. Let me declare two of these uh, monoid, inst uh, these uh, uh, given instances for monoid, one of which will be for strings and the other will be for ints. And as you can see, I still had to use the extension uh, sig, uh, syntax, although now it, you, know, you don't have to actually have def start on a new line. I can just put all of this on one line when I just have one of them to define. That's pretty nice. And similarly, I did it for um, uh, int. And of course, the zeros are you know, empty string or zero. And then we can try them out. And I'll just use the Darth Vader, Darth plus. Sorry, let's get that, get that right. And uh, you know, it works like you would expect. And notice that I can nicely reference the unit value just by calling string monoid because these are named given instances, you know, something colon type, et cetera. And if I made them anonymous, then I would have to use summon to fetch them as well. Well, it's kind of dumb to define an int monoid. We ought to do a numeric monoid, right? So let's see how that looks because then we can see a little bit about how type uh, types come into play, uh, type parameters. So here's what the monoid version would look like for a uh, numeric. Um, and now we see the, the alternative now to implicit parameter lists. These are called using clauses. Um, like givens, this can be anonymous. I can just say using numeric T. I can also write this as T colon numeric in the usual way for context bound. Uh, define it basically the same way as before. Uh, using a name here is convenient for referencing plus and zero. Um, and now I can just use this for like, you know, doubles and big decimal and so forth. Uh, while I'm here, I'm going to show you something, though, that we'll come back to. So what if I use combine instead? One of the things they're doing is tightening up the rules about in infix operator notation, because that's another thing that people tend to abuse. Um, I, I talk about this a little bit later, but there is a way I can declare this to actually allow it to be used in an infix context. And there's also some syntactic hacks I can use to use it this way, even if it's not declared as legal for infix. So this is a way for you to kind of limit what people, you know, if you really don't want people playing around with infix notation because you're a bad person or whatever, or you want to spoil everybody's fun, whatever your reason may be, uh, by default, that will be true for things that don't have, uh, that aren't written with operator characters, like combine here. Whereas the Darth, uh, a plus operator, you know, just used uh, operator uh, notation, if you, if you will. So it was uh, allowed to be used as an infix operator. All right. Actually, let me just uh, jump to the chase. The way that, um, or the, the main point, if I can go back a little bit, the way that you make combine, actually, it's maybe too far. I'll show you later, but basically there's an infix keyword that you use to make uh, combine uh, eligible for infix notation. Now here's something that will be very confusing uh, the first time you see it, but let's suppose that I decide instead, actually I'm not going to paste this in because then I'll have conflicting um, uh, given instances, but here's an anonymous uh, given instance for this numeric monoid. Uh, and it, when you look at this, it's, it's kind of hard to make sense of it when you first read it. But if you go back up to, uh, where was it? Oh, it's down here. If you compare what I've highlighted on the bottom with what's up here, the only difference is the word numeric monoid is, has been removed. So I removed the name. I had to leave the type in there, the, the bracket T, but otherwise they're identical. Uh, well, uh, actually this is wrong. I, I, I need to go back and fix this. I, and I no longer have a num here. Oh, sorry, I do have a num. This is okay, but if I wanna actually use it, then I have to use summon like is shown here. So if you see something like this, a given and then a type, and then you know some arguments, just remember there's a name that was left out to make it anonymous. But if you put in the name, if it helps you make sense of it, but uh, that's the only difference. And then of course that you have to use summon 
to actually get it in, in, uh, when you're running. Okay, uh, before I go on to using Colossus, I think I saw some questions. Anybody? Uh, there's one. Okay. So will all traits now require the extension keyword or only the one for type classes require it? And I, I think the answer is neither of those, but I'll let you elaborate. Yeah, so the reason extension was needed here is because I was using um, the, this type class syntax to basically add extension methods to existing types. But if you declare a trait and then you want to just you know subclass that trait to create a new thing, then you don't use the extension keyword. Uh, it, they're not extension methods in that case. Um, so that's that's the difference. Here I'm, I'm you know doing this thing that we've always done of like adding stuff to existing types. Now I have to use extension method syntax, but if I'm just subclassing an existing trait to create a new type, you don't have to use the uh, extension method syntax. And in fact, the, the unit worked in the old fashioned way. I basically, um, oh, in fact, I didn't, um, th this reminds me of what I didn't tell you about, which is notice the type signatures that are reported for these things. What I, because this still has a type parameter T, numeric monoid is a class, or is if I scroll back up to these other two monoids, they're actually objects because it knows everything it needs. It can just create an object. So here, unit is just a method on the object. And I said earlier that that's all we needed for string monoid and so forth. But I still have this extension method in scope. So if I suddenly um, you know, add two instances of integers or uh, strings, then it will uh, you know, modify the instance through the extension method. That's a good question, though. So yes. Extension is not a required thing now for traits, depending on how you use them. Okay, so uh, using, oh, by the way, on this page, I, I mentioned I've been doing a blog series. Uh, the blog post links go to uh, more details about a lot of these things. And a lot of the examples are just that are also in those blog posts. Okay, so what I did here with this sortable seek, I, 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 for, I just sort of ignored for a second the fact that you can already sort sequences with the sort by method, even though I actually used it in the implementation. But I, I use this wrapper type just to show you the, the four ways, the two old ways and the two new ways that you could write or, or declare you know, sort methods that need to take some sort of implicit parameter. So the old fashioned way would be either this, where we have an implicit argument list for some ordering, uh, you know, they can do ordering of type B, or we use a context bound syntax where it's B colon ordering. So this is the old fashioned way. Again, this will still work in Scala 3, but it'll probably be deprecated in 3.1 effectively and, and removed in some subsequent release. And then now the new way is to say, is to use a using clause instead of the uh, implicit keyword. And that can be anonymous in this example right here. And you can still use the context bound kind of syntax like so. All three ways work. And in these two cases where I don't have a name for my ordering, then I have to use summon to fetch it out of the ether, so to speak. So that's one difference. So here's an interesting thing that they decided to do. Um, it used to be that you just knew one keyword, which is implicit, and then you had a bunch of different contexts where you would use it, and you just had to kind of understand you know, what it meant in a given context. Now they've sort of flipped a little bit towards the idea of having separate terms for different things rather than overloading the same term. So whether you think that's better or worse, I'm not sure. Um, actually, I think it is a good idea here. You know where I think it may not be a great idea is underscore is now used much less often. There's now different, uh, there's like question mark is used for type wildcards. Uh, star is now used for import wildcards. Uh, and underscore is reserved for things like function placeholders and also type placeholders. So, you know, maybe the fact that underscore was used for everything kind of made it a little easier in some ways because you didn't have to remember what character to use. Now there's like three different characters. You have to remember which is which. Uh, it, I don't know if that's better or not, but uh, it's it's sort of an interesting trade off. OK. Um, so anyway, uh, one of the other interesting things about the using keyword is now if you pa explicitly pass an implicit parameter or what was an implicit parameter, you have to use the using keyword as part of the call for the method. And that actually allows you to do crazy things like this, where you can mix and match implicit parameter lists or using uh, clauses 
and regular parameter lists like so, like this example. <coughs> I, I can't say I know of a great example for this, but it does let you do things like this last example here. I'm, I'm going through this kind of quickly just for time's sake, but this last call actually uses an implicit value for the second parameter list, and then it, I just specify the first and third parameter list. So, but maybe the best part of it though, is that it's now really clear when you read code when something that's implicit is actually being explicitly passed. So I think this is actually a, a good move. Um, you can also do by name context parameters. They don't have to be just regular parameters. Uh, really not much more to say about this. Um, I think I'm gonna kind of gloss, I'm gonna skip over context functions just for time's sake. This is, I think, a pretty interesting idea, but it actually has taken me a while to get my head around it. Um, there's a really good example of using this, I think I mentioned it down here, in the Dottie documentation, where, where they actually use it to, um, wow, there's a typo right there. Um, yeah, in the Dottie documentation, there's a really nice example of building a DSL with these things. Basically, a context function is like a regular function, except all the arguments are uh, basically uh, using parameters. And that means that the compiler will implicitly invoke it. I think the best benefit will be something like this, where if you redefine future apply, instead of having like these implicit argument lists everywhere, you would actually do a, a type def of something that's now a context function that takes an execution context. And note the, uh, the way the type is indicated with the question mark. And then the, the method signature would be a little bit cleaner. But what would happen is when it's invoked, this executable thing would be returned by the apply method. The implicit arguments would be filled in immediately. And then that thing would be called that function that we just returned. And then you end up with uh, the, rem the future body at the end. It's a little complicated. Um, like I say, for, it's taken me a little bit of time to get my head around this. And, and maybe for that reason, I won't say more than that, but just as a teaser, you might try to work through this and look at the comments that I provided to see if they kind of help you make sense of it. And definitely look at this example down here, which is pretty interesting. It's like a, basically it's like a DSL that you could use to like build YAML files and stuff like that. Okay, but let's go on to something else. Um, an, another problem with implicits is, actually, let me break for questions quickly. Has anybody got any more? Doesn't look like it, but. Okay. Another problem with implicits is sometimes when you do like a wildcard import, you get all these implicits in scope that you didn't know about and it just causes problems. So now, um, and again, this is transitional, it'll not take effect in 3.0, <clears throat> but probably in 3.1. If you want to import implicits or givens as they're called now, you'll have to explicitly say, you know, something.given to import all of the, uh, the givens in that scope. The uh, wildcard star will imp imp uh, import everything else. So this line here, that's mark number 12, that will actually import everything in the old way, givens and non-givens, givens and takens, maybe. Um, I think they should call them takens personally, but you know, I don't make the rules. W what's a little bit unusual maybe off uh, is that when you, if you want to just import something specific, like I only want to import this guy, you actually go by the type. You say given uh, for some type. It sort of makes sense because you can only have one instance of a type that's a given. Otherwise, you'd end up with you know, these ambiguities at compile time. But uh, you know, when I first tried this, I thought I should be able to just say underscore C1. But no, if I know the specific name of something, I just import it in the old-fashioned way. Uh, C2 is uh, given for this C2 type. But if I just want whatever the given is, anonymous or otherwise, for type C1, then it's this syntax. Okay. Um, I think I'll also uh, skip over alias givens. This was kind of what I was hinting at earlier when I said that there's a couple of ways that the equal sign can be confusing. This alias given is actually a different way to define a given where I'm effectively defining an alias for it, in this case, numeric monoid two, where I just instantiate some monoid type and then you know, fill in the details. Whereas recall before that I used the with keyword uh, and then define the methods. And I put in these print statements because when you actually run this, it turns out that the numeric monoid is actually defined as a method 
Um, you can see that here, this is the uh, shell output. This is actually a method, so it's called four times. It does this setup of these methods four times if I use that in numeric monoid. Whereas for a string monoid, it's still a lazy value, so at least it's only initialized once. I'm not entirely sure, uh, you know, to me, this is potentially confusing. There's probably a really good reason for having alias givens. Maybe it's more flexibility. If I already have something defined and I want to turn it, you know, make an alias or make a given out of it, this is obviously what I would use. So maybe that's, that's the best reason for alias givens. But I think it will be confusing because if you're used to like subclassing a trait, <coughs> defining a new instance on the fly, it'd be really easy to think that this is actually creating a, like a normal given, if that's the right term, when in fact I'm creating an alias and I've got this kind of interesting, maybe slightly quirky uh, life cycle behavior. So this is not the way you'll normally define these given instances like these type classes. This is actually an alias of something. Hope that made some sense. Uh, another thing I'm going to skip is type class derivation because it's also a little bit time consuming to go through. But basically, it's now a facility where you can define type classes, and there's one built in called can equal that the co compiler can then generate the instances automatically for you. And you don't have to do the boilerplate that I did earlier, like you know the ones that are like uh, monoids and stuff up here. Um, and the, the syntax is this, a new keyword derived. So if I'm de declaring some tree of things and I'm showing you enum syntax that I'll get into in a minute, then this will actually derive some equality checking uh, operations for me automatically that I don't have to do. I'm actually showing you two things here. One is this derivation feature, which is kind of cool. Uh, and actually the way that you define these, there's you have to use the, the new uh, metaprogramming library to um, define these things. But it's also testing uh, a new or demonstrating a new feature called strict equality, which is uh, taking us, and I think this is going to be very transformational over time. Right now we have universal equality. I can compare anything to anything else. And sometimes the compiler will say, you know what, you're comparing a int to a uh, option event. There's no way they'll ever be equal. Even Scala 2 does, or Scala 2.12 would do this. But um, What's a little more subtle is if I have like a tree of integers and a tree of strings, I really shouldn't be comparing those either. And if I try to do that now with this feature that I'm just using, I'll actually get a compiler error that these two types cannot be compared. And the reason they can't be compared is because I turned on strict equality. I use this uh, derivation of can equal. And what I've done is I've turned my universe into a multiverse where there's now, uh, let's call them sets of things that I can compare but I can't compare things across the set. Again, I think this will be transformational in a lot of ways. I didn't actually turn this on in the book examples because it breaks a lot of code that's otherwise safe. So it's gonna take some effort to transform your code to actually use strict equality. But that's sort of the idea with that and can equal is a way of implementing it. I, I encourage you to check this out because it's pretty neat, but it's, it may not be something that you use right away. As far as I know, there's only one uh, derivable type class in the Scala 3 library, which, by the way, the Scala 3 library is using the Scala 2.13 library verbatim, but it's adding a few more things like just some types like this, the conversion type we saw earlier, and so forth. Okay. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that they're tightening the rules for uh, using uh, like... Um, uh, alphanumeric uh, method names as operators. So uh, I showed you this earlier that the, the way I declared those traits earlier, I'm not allowed to actually do this. Uh, if you turn on this, this feature, uh, this is one of those things that'll be allowed in 3.0. But there are a couple of ways you can still use it. And this, this first one is bizarre, but if I use curly braces instead of parentheses, this is allowed. Now, it's not as bizarre as maybe as it looks. What it's really doing is letting us do what we've always done with like collections, you know, uh, you know, collection, fold left, or maybe map is a better example, curly braces stuff, that'll all still work in the old fashioned way. Similarly, there's another escape hatch, which, which is backticks. This will also let you use uh, an, uh, something that's not declared as an infix uh, method. But if I really want this to be infix, then I use the new keyword 
like I'm, I've done this uh, uh, enhancement now to semi-group. A key thing to know though, is I also have to do this on all of the instantiations or, of this method. So uh, if you omit infix here, then the, this method will not actually be allowed to be used as infix. I'm not really sure why, but I kind of think it's the same reason as you have to be consistent about package versus protected versus private scope and all that kind of stuff. I think that's sort of the rationale for requiring the keyword here. But anyway, that's, that's, that's what you do if you really want to allow, uh, inf uh, you know, let people use something as an infix operator, just declare it as infix. Uh, oh, an interesting point here. So there's a whole bunch of new keywords, right, that we've already seen. Uh, there's using, there's uh, given, there's infix, uh, as. Um, in most cases, the new ones are considered soft keywords in the sense that if they're seen in a position like this, then they're significant as a keyword. But I could also use them as, as uh, regular terms uh, elsewhere in other contexts, and that'll still be allowed in part for some, uh, they don't break code that happen to use infix as the name of the argument here. So in a lot of cases, you'll see, if you see something marked as a soft modifier or a soft whatever, that's what that means, that only in, in used in the right context is it considered a keyword. Otherwise, it's just considered a regular identifier. And if I make that change to these types, then I can just write this as I you know, tried to do earlier. OK, enumerations. Uh, I love this change. Uh, I could never, ever remember the old syntax for the life of me. I always had to look it up. Uh, if I just want a simple uh, list of you know, identifiers, then I just do enum, simple color, and then case, and there they are. If I want to add uh, values, you know, like fields, I, it's, it's a little bit fancier like this. Uh, extends and the parent uh, wrapper type is actually implicit up here. So red is basically red extends simple color, but you can omit it when there's nothing to pass as an argument. And this also is flexible enough that we can now use it for abstract data types. So if Scala 3 wasn't using the Scala 2 library, then this is probably how, e uh, how options would be defined. There is one, there are a couple of slight differences though. In the Scala 2 library, options sum and none are all at the same scope. So if I do like the underscore import or star import now, they would all show up. Whereas now I would have to import option dot star to get sum and none. So there are some differences, but uh, this is a much more concise way now to write abstract data types. <coughs> uh, and I put in this comment after doing this talk last fall as Seth was online and he, he reminded everybody that um, uh, the Scala 213 library is being used in Scala 3. So that helps a lot with uh, backwards compatibility. Okay, let's see. We're probably getting near the end of time. So let me um, just kind of quickly highlight a few interesting changes in the, in, in the type system and uh, just encourage you to check this out for more detail later. Uh, one is an alternative to value classes called, um, uh, I'll admit this person to the room. There we go called, um, where is it, opaque type aliases. So suppose I want to wrap double. I really want doubles to be used at runtime because I'm writing some numeric algorithm and I want it to be fast, but I want to have you know, class-like semantics. You know, here's how it works. Opaque type, you know, logarithm equals double. I can declare an object logarithm where I have to explicitly define things that I get with case classes like apply methods, and uh, like here's a safe thing that will handle the case where I try to pass a zero to a logarithm, which is negative infinity and so forth. I can define extension methods. Now, none of the double methods are available on logarithms. So like division is not available the way I defined it, only plus and addition and then extracting the value. The big advantage of these things is that they'll never be wrapped. That was a problem with value classes. Occasionally you would actually, uh, the compiler would have to instantiate the wrapper type and you would lose the benefit of uh, the, the goal, which was to only have the type that was being wrapped, managed in memory, and the other thing kind of disappearing from bytecode. That doesn't happen with these. There are some disadvantages though, and that's why they're not a complete replacement. Um, and here's an example of it used. And so if you look through this, it looks pretty much kind of what you would expect if these were like regular case classes. Some of the disadvantages are you cannot override two string and equals. Um, they will be ignored. I actually tried this earlier. I uh, took that example. It was over here, I think. 
And uh, I added two string, let me unhighlight it so you can read it. And it was this, this two string implementation was completely ignored when I tried it. So I'm not sure why it was ignored as opposed to like triggering a compile error, but some methods you cannot override with this mechanism. Whereas value classes are real classes. So you can override them when you really need to do something like that. So, um, and the other reason for keeping value classes around is there is this uh, Valhalla project in the uh, JDK, which like the real Valhalla seems to never you know, be accessible. It's like always been out in the future. Um, but nevertheless, if it ever uh, gets materialized, then um, uh, this uh, Scala value classes will be a nice encapsulation of that. That's the plan. Here's another feature I really love. Unless you declare a concrete class open for extension, you're not allowed to subclass it. So this will prevent people from doing things that you know they shouldn't do unless you explicitly say it's okay. Now, this can also be enabled as a language feature. So here's how I'm gonna use this. I'm gonna you know, leave a lot of my classes closed without the keyword, but when I wanna create a test double in a test, I'll import this language that uh, feature that lets me do these ad hoc extensions and only there do like the subclass of the thing where I override some method to you know, mock out behavior or whatever the heck I wanna do. So I think this will be a really nicely done feature. And that's, it get, that, that's the difference between declaring something final is that I still can subclass it, but only under certain controlled conditions. So I kind of really like this change. Um, Maybe the last couple of things I'll talk about and then we'll break is um, to make the type system behave more along the lines of how set theory works, we now have intersection and union types. Uh, intersection types replace with, although you still actually use with when you declare them. So let's suppose I've got so, a couple of very lightweight traits, like I can reset something or I can grow something that's you know like a collection or whatever. And then I'm going to, uh, define a function that takes, um, did I say intersection or, okay, we're talking about intersection type, sorry. So th this, this function takes, uh, or method rather, takes an X that is of type resettable and growable string. And then it's gonna return a new string. And now I can call those methods that are defined by these traits. And some, somebody's got to instantiate something that uh, mixes in both of those traits. And it makes the definition actually uses the with keyword or extends as before. Um, so to actually create one, like here's a, here's a class, a case class that extends resettable with growable. And here's one that does the reverse, growable and resettable. Now, why did I do that? Uh, well, the main reason is because when I do things like two string, I'm going to call the super method. And if you know anything about linearization, you know, how the compiler decides, you know, which thing in the parent hierarchy it should call, linearization is the algorithm. And it turns out the output of two string is going to be different for these two. But here's something that's very important to know. Unlike, you know, resettable with growable in Scala 2, these two types are considered to be... Um, <coughs> You know, equivalent. So they actually commute in the way that, you know, uh, set that they would commute in like the uh, intersection of two sets. So they're considered the same type, but they don't necessarily behave the same way at runtime. So if I actually run these things, like instantiate two instances of RG and GR, and the, the two string that method or that's called will actually print different output depending on which one it is, even though they're considered type equivalent. So I can pass both of them to F, even though I declared it one way in F, the other way is just perfectly fine. But it's important to know that the behavior is not necessarily symmetric or, or equivalent rather, that it, it still be, uh, follows the rules of linearization when deciding you know, how to uh, invoke super methods. So that's an interesting difference between uh, this idea that they're equivalent and yet they don't necessarily behave equivalently at, uh, when you call methods on them. Okay, uh, so that's enough for um, intersection types. <clears throat> what about union types? Union types are kind of like a, 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 an arbitrary extension of either, although they don't have all the monadic methods and all that stuff. So uh, I, I sort of mocked up this example where I'm gonna have a case class of user, and then I'm gonna uh, you know, ask my database to give me a user of some ID, but I'm gonna allow the database to return an error string 
or a single user, or maybe a sequence of users if somehow the ID is not unique. <coughs> and that's how I declare a uh, uh, intersection type. Now this code example won't actually work because I haven't defined some of these types like DB connection. But um, you know, I just sort of mocked up how it might behave based on the results set from a SQL query. But the, the important thing is how do I actually use something of type string or user or sequence of user? And the way you always use them is with a match clause or match expression. So in this case, I have to match on all three possibilities. Either it's a string and this was some sort of error or it's a single user and I might pull out the name and so forth, or it's a sequence. And this is, you know, a, a, a complete match. There's no chance that it'll, you know, I'll get a match error at runtime. Uh, let's see, Brian also asked a question here, if I can uh, read it. Uh, it seems like the type equivalent, but possibly behavioral different aspect of intersection types could cause a lot of confusion. I think that's true. Um, and I'm not sure what to say about that beyond that. It's obvious that they didn't want to break linearization. I'm not sure what they could have done as an alternative, but I think people will probably get confused if they think that something behaves equivalently, even if it's typed identically. That, that's definitely not the case. Okay. So anyway, with intersection types, you always work with them with match clauses because you have to figure out what it is you actually got back. So. Now, here's another cool thing about match types. We now have the ability to use them at the type level. This is actually a type alias. I'm going to pass it some sort of collection, and it's going to return whatever the type that's contained within that collection is. If it's a string, a string is basically an array of char, and you, you have to do this as a special case. The, uh, the array won't work, actually. You know, or it's an array of some type t, and it's going to return t, or iterable once covers almost everything else. Um, and then, it, and here is the um, uh, wildcard. Did I get that right? No, this is the placeholder. Sorry, it is the wildcard. Yes, it's the wildcard, not the placeholder for types. So you see, the, I, even I, you know, I've been thinking about this for a while. I'm still confused about what's what, but you, you use question mark instead of underscore. And that's like the catch all for anything else. So if I said elm of, you know, integer, then it would return int. But if I say elm of uh, sequence of string, it's going to return string. And here's some examples. Actually, let me just paste this in because it's kind of fun to play with this. So there's my type alias. And let's see what it returns. Uh, well, I, what I can do is I can declare things of these types. And then I have to assign something that's type compatible on the right hand side. So these won't work right here where I try to assign um so why did you, there we go um oh so here's the problem it's not recursive this definition so this has to be list of double but i gave it a double uh similarly here i just gave it a completely uh incompatible type of tuple there is a way you can define these to be recursive though and i show an example in the book and i think maybe in the blog post too but um, it is kind of neat that you can do this kind of type algebra at runtime, or at compile time rather. So this is this this is all parsed at compile time. It's a little not obvious when you're working in the REPL, but these are actually compiler errors, not runtime errors. And then you can always summon to uh, find out what exists. You know, is it really possible that uh, you know elm of string is a char and blah blah blah? And sure enough, you can use summon to, to tell you what's what's legal and what is. Notice what it returned for none type. This is kind of cool. It returned nothing, which, is, which it should have. Uh, if you if you're not if it, this is kind of a, uh, something you've never seen before, if you have an object and you want to get the type, then you use none dot, dot type. Uh, type lambdas. Uh, this is something that many of you have probably uh, used some uh, plugin libraries for Scala 2 to give you basically a lambda, a way of defining the analog of a anonymous function, but at the type level. Now it turns out this is actually equivalent to this, which may look more familiar. So basically they're the same thing, but this is actually kind of useful still because I can curry these things. So I could do something like type, let's just call it E, you know, equals um, uh, like, uh, let's call it T1, uh, notice the arrow which syntax, 
T2. So that's also you know, something you can do. So this is really nice when you have a situation where I have a, 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 like a parameterized method that takes a, an object of one type parameter, but I want to pass in an either, but the first type is always string. So I need a nice way to just create a type alias of one type parameter. I can very cleanly do it this way. Or if I want to even go farther, there's, there's situations where I might want to use currying like this. And so it's kind of a nice analog of uh, anonymous functions. Okay, well, that's basically it. So the last section here uh, talks a little bit about some of the compiler flags that control, you know, how much of the new versus old syntax you want to require in your code base. You know, quite frankly, if you're migrating to Scala 2 code base, you should probably stick with curly braces, maybe stick with the um, uh, you know, uh, parentheses around conditionals and using, uh, uh, you know, not using the new syntax for those and for loops. Actually, this, these two arguments don't affect the uh, for loops versus for comprehensions. Uh, you can also um, use it, these flags to actually get the compiler to convert your code into Scala 3 idioms uh, with migration and rewrite, which is kind of nifty, uh, including using this indent flag to get rid of uh, most of the braces. And there's, then there's a list here of stuff that I just didn't get into. There's actually, maybe I'll call out this one. You can now do H-list kind of uh, programming with tuples. If, you're, if you love shapeless, check out the new tuple stuff. That's pretty cool. Uh, explicit nulls now with union types or, uh, in, uh, yeah, no, intersection, yeah, union types. We can now um, uh, actually call out explicitly that this Java method might return null. Uh, and there's also a new way of defining main methods uh, rather than the old way. So that's probably enough for now. Uh, any final questions? Any I'm going to throw day? I'm going to throw one out because yeah. I saw this come up recently uh, on a tweet. Checked exceptions. Checked exceptions. Yeah. And the basic um, question is like everybody was so against checked exceptions as a concept when in in original Scala, and yet apparently they're being introduced in Scala three. Do you have any? Um, yeah, I, I saw I saw that too. I don't think it's in 3.0, um, although I, I just downloaded the RC3 and I didn't actually try to see if there was such a thing. I think that's going to come in 3.1. And I'm, I honestly don't, I haven't had a chance to go back and look and see why. Um, I, I think it's mostly Mark's idea what, why he wants to introduce these. I suppose it would in some ways make interop with Java a little bit clearer in some respects. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of checked exceptions. So, um, and, and in part because I think really we should be using either's or similar kind of validation sort of type of return types anyway, most of the time. I'm trying to get my colleagues at Domino to throw fewer exceptions and use this more often. So I'm not convinced that's a good idea. And you do have another question in the chat. Yeah, so uh, that uh, my Darth plus operator, it is automatically allowed to be infix because it just uses operator characters. So the usual, you know, the original reason for supporting infix notation, which is to let you, you know, define your own operators, that's, that's, they're, they're still trying to preserve that. So something like less than plus greater than, or, you know, slash slash or whatever, those will still always be allowed to be infix without explicitly being declared infix. It's the things like combine, map, plus, um, plus. Those are the sort of things where you have to be more uh, principled about it, is the idea. Any more questions before we wrap it up for the evening? Has anybody else done a lot with Scala 3? I know some of you on the call are probably working on like upgrading uh, cats and things like that, but. Uh, I'm curious what if anyone wants to volunteer their experiences so far with it. All right. Well, you've got an exciting journey ahead of you, I guess. And I think buying Dean's book will help all of us. That's right. Yeah. When uh, when is that going to be updated and published? Um, we're in the final edits now. Actually, I just found an error today that I need to have them put in. Uh, it's, it's sort of in the copy editing phase right now. So I think it'll probably be about a month 
that the ebook will be out. Probably around the time Scala 3 is actually released. Awesome. Well, if there are no other, uh, no other questions, I'd like to thank Dean for uh, volunteering to give this talk. Um, I didn't even have to ask. And as I said last time that happened, that's the best way to get a speaker is when they volunteer and you don't have to beg them. So thank you so much, Dean. I've, uh, I've really enjoyed this. I hope everybody else has. Um, and I think that's it for the evening. All right. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate you uh, coming out.